I'm Christopher Granger, and I'm delighted to be here today with Neha Pagadapati and Adam Nelson, um, cardiologist from Duke and from Australia, to talk about a very important topic, and that is how can we improve the care of patients who have diabetes and cardiovascular disease, particularly now that we have some very effective new drugs available. So welcome, Neha and Adam. Thanks, Chris. Thank Thanks you for having us. having us. So we're in this interesting situation. We know that, um, and we'll go over some of this in more detail, but we know that um, cardiovascular disease and diabetes, enormous public health concern as obesity and diabetes is in an epidemic, particularly in the United States. And uh, we also know that we have these drugs which um, were went through this process of FDA regulatory review intending to prove that they were safe when in fact we were delighted to see that some of them are highly effective at reducing mm -hmm. cardiovascular outcomes. But we also know they're not being used. And, uh, and we know part of the reason they're not being used is because cardiologists do not feel empowered to use them. So in this discussion with you all, what I would like for our audience to come away with is the knowledge and confidence to use these drugs when appropriate mm -hmm. as cardiovascular drugs to improve the outcome of their patients. And we know that a third or more of mm -hmm. our typical cardiology patients have type two diabetes in addition to their either risk or actual cardiovascular disease. So Adam, maybe we could start with you. We've got, you know, we do want to focus some on these two classes of drugs, the SGLT2 inhibitors and the GLP-1 receptor yes, agonists. Yeah. And if you could just tell us a bit about the mechanisms of these drugs, which were originally developed to lower blood glucose, but have lots of other activities that might be of benefit to our patients. Absolutely, Chris. I mean, look, perhaps it's nice to start with the SGLT2 class, and these are agents, as you say, that we're particularly excited about. Uh, that we saw you know, seminal results in 2015, and uh, I'll be able to show this for the viewers at home, but the, the seminal study of, of, of Empareg showing with empagliflozin therapy that patients derived not just CV benefit, Chris, but all cause mortality changes, curves that separated as early as three to six months that continue to diverge over 12 months. These are agents, as I said, SGLT2 is a receptor that's located mainly in the proximal tubule of the kidney, responsible for reabsorption of glucose. We see these agents inhibit um, more than 50% of the glucose that is filtered um, uh, and, and we see that uh, not only are they associated with, with A1C reductions, as you mentioned, but also CV benefit. Um, we see the mechanism of bene benefit possibly derived around uh, not only the, the, the effects of glycosuria, uh, but also some degree of naturesis, which may improve volume status, subtle changes in weight subtle changes in blood pressure. So really exciting class of medication. And let me, let me interrupt you there and just ask Neha. So, yeah. so these are drugs that cause about a 0.5 to 1% uh, percent reduction in hemoglobin A1C, not, not particularly effective at lowering blood sugar, but have these really important benefits that Adam will describe in a bit more detail um, on cardiovascular outcome and reducing heart failure events. And um, I don't think anybody was hypothesizing that a, a drug which which increases glucose in the urine would have such profound effects. Yeah. So what, yeah. what do you think is the, I know we don't know, but what do you think <laughs> may be the mechanism for that? It's an excellent question. You're exactly right that nobody, nobody saw this coming. Um, and I think what has um, come to light and I think is incredibly important is that yes, these medications were originally formulated as diabetes yeah. drugs, as A1C lowering drugs, but clearly their benefit is in cardiovascular risk reduction. And so these, as I tell my patients and I tell my colleagues, these are cardiovascular risk reduction drugs much more than their diabetes drugs. But then the question is, what is it that they're doing? And I think that there are a, you know, a number of potential effects. Um, initially, there was a lot of um, excitement and, um, uh, you know, questions around this idea of whether or not SGLT2 inhibitors are really just diuretics. And mm. they are diuretic therapy to some degree. They're sure. mild diuretics. But I think it's become clear that their full effect is not limited to just yeah. their diuretic mechanism. Um, they clearly have um, effects beyond just diuresis and beyond the natriuresis that we see um, with the glucose and the urine. Um, I think some of the other effects are still very exploratory at this point. There's some um, question about whether or not they change the way we metabolize um, energy and whether or not 
potentially a failing heart metabolizes energy differently, and this SGLT2 mm -hmm. inhibitor class could help um, failing hearts metabolize better. Um, but I think there are a number of potential things that are going on, and it's not clear yet what exactly is causing the benefit, either, for example, with SGLT2 inhibitors in their renal benefits, their heart failure benefits, or their secondary prevention for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And I think it's interesting yeah. that they seem to constrict the afferent yes. arterial to the kidneys, yes. and maybe that decreases some of the um, <laughs> glomerular um, gradient, yeah. and maybe yes. that has some renal protective and all kinds of other effects that kind of go down a cascade. But, but, um, but the key thing you said, Neha, to come back to this, is that these are cardiovascular drugs. Yeah. And, and that's the whole point of this session is to emphasize that, yeah. that these drugs have profound effects on cardiovascular outcomes. And Adam, maybe we can jump even right to one of the punchlines, which is the DAPA heart failure trial. Yeah, absolutely, Chris. I mean, uh, look, just uh, to, to take your segue, I mean, DAPA-HF was a study which enrolled patients with underlying LV dysfunction, uh, recruited patients that both had diabetes and those that didn't, and they were given... Uh, um, an SGLT2 inhibitor and what we saw was uh, not only profound benefits in, in CV death and heart failure reduction, um, when we looked at patients that had both diabetes and those that didn't, they derived the same benefit. And so what we see here is that not only a continuing um, uh, signal that the, the, the benefits of these agents are independent of A1C uh, in the early trials, we see here in patients without diabetes at all, they derive the same magnitude of benefit. And, and so, I'll just highlight that, uh, you know, and John McMurray makes such a good point of this, that if you stack up dapagliflozin in that case against other proven effective treatments, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, secubitril, valsartan, spironolactone, the results of the DAPA heart failure trial are equally or more impressive than any other yes. treatment we use for heart failure, about a 30% reduction in heart failure mm -hmm. hospitalization. So these are, so I think the point here is this moves these drugs into cardiovascular yes. drug sweet spot. Mm -hmm. If you're a cardiologist, you must know about these drugs and how to use them if you're going to do a quality job taking care of your patients. And I think another really important point that I took away from that study that I think is particularly relevant for cardiologists is that in the patients who did not have diabetes, they were not, they did not have ill effects from the, from the yes. glucose lowering. So they did not have higher rates of hypoglycemia yes. um, than uh -huh. did the diabetes patient, the patients with diabetes, or then did the, did the placebo arm. And so it's not like, um, again, these are not just diabetes drugs, yes. and it's not like you would be causing harm if anything you, you lead to benefit in patients without diabetes as well. So let's, so you mentioned that, uh, I think it's also important what you mentioned about Empareg. So Empareg, the first trial that we saw in, in these, um, the first cardiovascular outcomes trial in these two classes of yes. drugs that was um, positive, mm -hmm. had this 32% relative risk reduction in all-cause mortality. Really a profound, um, a profound benefit. So Adam, let's switch gears now to the other class of drugs, the GLP-1 receptor agonists. Yes, so the GLP-1 receptor agonists, uh, in fairness, were, were studied more or less synchronously to the SGLT2 class. And in fact, the LEADER trial, which was the first agent that was studied in an outcome trial with uh, liraglutide, uh, came out within 12, 18 months of, of the EMPA-REG study. GLP-1 uh, is, is a hormone that's secreted around oral intake. And so we see the receptors for this sit in the gut, they sit in the brain. They sit in blood vessels that have a number of different effects. Most potently, perhaps, is that they do slow gastric emptying and they encourage uh, a sensation of satiety. And so when we look at the mechanisms around these agents, not only do we see weight loss around perhaps some of those components of, 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 of those drug effects, uh, we see glucose lowering. Um, and over time, we see some weight loss as well, Chris. So these are agents, again, that not only were brought in, uh, in, in line with glycemic control, but we see them hitting a number of other receptors that are potentially of, of significant cardiovascular benefit. And with that in mind, we see the leader try a number of other GLP-1 uh, studies show CV benefit independent uh, of their A1C lowering effects. And that also was, a, was an important benefit. And also leader had a statistically significant reduction in cardiovascular death. Yes, yeah, exactly. So these yeah. are, you know, these are not just effects on, you know, borderline cardiovascular outcomes. Um, these are really important um, uh, benefits. But unlike the SG, SGLT2 inhibitors, where every single large trial has shown an improvement in cardiovascular outcome, especially in heart failure, yeah. 
GLP-1 receptor agonists are a little bit more heterogeneous. And what, what do we know about that? Chris, they are. And look, you've hit the nail on the head. What we see in SGLT2s with the trials is really consistent treatment effects. Mm -hmm. um, nicely, we see some degree of, uh, of, of, uh, of outcome change around the baseline risk of the population. So perhaps between MPREG and, and the later Credence trial, but we see the same relative risk reductions. Uh, what we see in the GLP-1 class, interestingly, is heterogeneity, where we see um, the initial classes, the, the ones that were studied in uh, Elixir and Excel, we didn't see any of the, anywhere near the same benefit. We look at some of the mechanisms around that, potentially that may speak to the homology of the GLP-1 uh, agonism around that space. So we see the, the agents that have got the most similarity to the, to the endogenous GLP-1 um, having the greatest CV benefit, and those that have got less than 60%, those two agents I mentioned, um, we see much less CV benefit. So it may speak to that, Chris. It may be baseline characteristics of the trial. It may be play of chance. Um, but there is clearly some degree of heterogeneity around the GLP-1 class that we have not seen in the SGLT2s to date. And there's also, you know, other effects that you alluded to include reduction in blood pressure. Yes. Um, what other effects, Neha, do you think are appealing about the GLP-1 receptor agonists? For the GLP-1 receptor agonists? Well, I think clearly one of the um, most appealing um, effects of the GLP-1 receptor agonists is the weight loss. Yes. And the weight loss can, can be very profound and indeed... Um, one of the agents is marketed as an, as an anti-obesity medication. Um, part of that um, may be uh, related to the slowing in gastric emptying, mm -hmm. and so patients do tend to get um, nausea and vomiting um, that can sometimes be limiting, but I think the really important thing um, with that when we're counseling patients is to let them know that that will pass over time, that they just have to stick with it, and there's really kind of a counseling component to keeping them with it. But I think that's one of the things that the patients that I have um, that I have taken care of who have been started on GLP-1 receptor agonists, they've really appreciated the weight loss component. So I yeah. think that that is something that um, I I definitely take into account. I think um, you get a little bit more A1C lowering. Again, as cardiologists, that may not be our primary focus, um, but you do you do get um, some of that. I think most of the GLP-1 receptor agonists you can also use down to a slightly lower EGFR, though that is not the case for invocan. Uh, sorry, canagliflozin, um, which can also be used down to an EGFR of 30, and that may be changing for the rest of the SGLT2 class as well. Um, but I think those are some of the particular benefits that I see with GLP-1 receptor agonists, and a lot of it really is around the weight loss component. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, of course, GLP-1 receptor agonists are injectable with the exception of an oral formulation of yes. semaglutide, which has not yet gone through the evaluation for cardiovascular uh, protection. Correct. So for the time being, if one's going to use a GLP-1 receptor agonist, it means prescribing an injectable, which is um, probably more acceptable to patients than the average cardiologist realizes, yeah. but still is a bit more of a challenge. It's true. It's really interesting because some of the um, some of the injectables are daily dosing and some of them are weekly dosing. And there are patients who really like the idea of just taking a medication once a week. I will say that in general, um, the patients that I um, have started on GLP-1 receptor agonists, even those who have no prior um, experience with injectables, like they were not previously on, on insulin, um, they have found it extremely easy because the um, devices themselves are extremely easy to use and they just really don't even feel um, the pinch. Um, and and so it's actually not as, as, as much of a negative to patients as I think we often think it will be. Yeah, and maybe that's an obvious question, but, but some people I think still think of these drugs which were originally designed as glucose lowering, that they're gonna have their benefits through glucose lowering. And what do we know about that? Is there a linkage between the degree of glucose control and the cardiovascular benefit or not? Chris, it's, it's a great point. I think the, the challenge in this space has been we've seen years and years of outcome trials uh, for the cardiologist where glycemic control hasn't really translated to macrovascular benefit. Mm -hmm. um, and yet we've harped on about the importance of control of diabetes with respect to microvascular changes, diabetic nephropathy and what have you. Um, we've seen excitingly with this class that there has been no heterogeneity of, uh, heterogeneity of, of, of effect with, with A1C. So whether patients derive A1C benefits or not in the trials, they've continued to derive CV That's benefit. Right. Um, and so uh, this is important. And, and so when we talk about messaging these agents to the cardiologist, this isn't about treating to target A1C. It's, it's finding space in their regimen to allow these agents to be brought in in a safe and effective manner. Um, as Neha mentioned, we see A1Cs that reduce slightly more with a GLP-1 RA than we do with an SGLT2. Um, but, but really, the, these agents have got proven benefit um, regardless of starting A1C that we've seen so far. Well, thank you, Adam Neha, for that great discussion about uh, mechanism of action and how that mechanism of action may link to these um, 
proven benefits for cardiovascular outcomes. And, um, and thank you to our audience for listening to this.